Okay. <laughs> well, that was a yeah. short 20 minutes technical break. Yeah. I hope you uh, you got refreshed and whatnot. Uh, yeah. So second talk is yeah. by Lynn. Yeah. It's a great pleasure to have you here. Yeah. And uh, it's going to talk about does sparsity have in learning misspecified linear bandits? Thanks for the invitation. It's a great, my great pleasure to be here. So I'm talking about the sparsity helping and uh, learning misspecified linear bandits. So I know of you, most of you are uh, experts in bandits. Uh, you know what is a modern bandit problem? So uh, you have an agent that interacts with a one state environment for multiple uh, runs. Each time the agent can take an action and get a reward. And the goal is to maximize community reward. Right? Usually we want to um, want to adjust the multiple arms, so in that way we usually do linear bandit, right? Do the linear bandits. Assume that the uh, underlying model has a linear structure. So now that that usually is not exactly the case, right? When you, especially in practice, right? Even though you assume that it's linear, but it's not necessarily the linear thing, right? So that will be a misspecification in the sense that the model you say that it's a linear model, but it's actually not. There will be some mismatch between the real model and the one choose, right? That's what we call misspecification. Right? And then well, well, what should we do if that happens? So that is the uh, that is the question we, we're trying to uh, answer in this talk. So basically, we're gonna think about uh, the simple model. So I'm talking about misspecification in the sense that the noise is not going to be going to be statistical in the sense it's not randomized. So, or, or in other words, even though you have infinite many samples, uh, the noise the noise is still there. The error is still there. So, uh, in order to understand this kind of thing, right? So, why don't we just consider linear? Uh, sorry, deterministic systems, right? So we just get rid of this statistic noise at all, so that we can we can have a better understanding. Okay, so here's the model. To have k actions, k can be um, super big, for instance, exponential in D, okay? So D is the feature dimension, k is the, it, it, k is the number of actions. It can be uh, infinite or it can be uh, finite, but it should be exponential in D. Think about k as exponential in D, okay? So now for every action, you can stack all that, all the feature vectors together, then get a matrix phi that is k by D dimensional. So now if you put an action A, okay, so then at time T, right? So the reward you get is deterministic. Uh, the model is like this it's linear model plus the noise, okay? So that noise is a deterministic noise, but you don't know what it is. But it's up, it's bounded, okay? It's bounded, the absolute value is bounded by epsilon. It's in between minus epsilon, epsilon, but it's a deterministic noise, okay? So that is the model, okay? So our goal is to learn a action, right? So an action that is at the least delta optimal in the sense that this action, the value R it gets is at most delta away from the optimal value. That is our goal, okay? So is that clear for the model? Okay. So it's the noise, but it's not really noise. It's just the specification. Yeah, specification error. Yeah, you can only see from It depends on the state and action. Right. So if you come back to the second action, if you get the same Yeah, yeah. It's deterministic model. So everything is deterministic. We don't have a randomness at all. Okay. All right. So that is the that is the problem. Yeah, very simple. All right. So this problem has oh it has some pages. What? Mm -hmm. has in ten pages. Is it an image issue? It's a new issue. Yeah, it's, I think it's internet. Oh, anyway. Here they <laughs> Right. This was what has been studied uh, some time ago by the duo. This is uh, also my favorite and one of the talkers. So we, we were trying to understand if you have misspecification for for Q learning, you have for Q star, then you have a, a slight misspecification. Can you still learn a Q star? So we find that okay. So if you want to have this small error, that's that is all epsilon. Remember that misspecification error is epsilon. Okay. So now you want to learn a, a action that is epsilon near epsilon alpha. 
in the sense that you, you want to approach in the limit, right? Uh, the limit is epsilon. You want to approach in the limit. Then it turns out you really need to pull exponential many actions to check. Okay. So that the, the understanding is that if it, if the, the action set is a union ball, right? So then you really need to pull out nearly every action in the epsilon net, right? So nearly every action in order to get a good understanding of the structure. Okay. That is a no, and that's the that's the best you can do. Okay. So if you want to O epsilon, then omega D. Uh, omega exponential in d actions okay and then later Trevor and uh, and paul and uh, galley right so they have a paper saying that okay so if you uh relax this um uh, this approximation a little bit for instance um we don't want an epsilon of optimal action when a square root d times epsilon uh, optimal action then it's easy you just put polynomial d actually it's d log log d many actions and then you can solve for an action and that action is square root d times epsilon optimal. Okay, that's a little bit up uh, until now. Okay, so now we can clearly say that is a square root d blow up, right? So in terms of the error, if you want, if you really want a polynomial query complexity, then through square root d is not avoidable, right? So in the in the worst case, in the worst case, all right, that that's clear, right, for this student. All right, so today I'm going. Uh, what? It's PowerPoint. It's, uh, well, it's not updating yeah, the screen. The screen is not updating. Uh, this is going to be crazy. <laughs> it is very crazy. Yeah. No idea what's going on. Sure. Yeah, see so right now it's sharing and it's not going to share. It's stop uh, soon. Uh, check it. Yeah, it's working now, but it will not work soon. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you have to be faster, man. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Just change the. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I should send slides to someone who can help me. <laughs> and let, let me let, let's just chat. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we want to break basically the barrier. So we want to polynomial samples, but we still want to something um, better than square root d times epsilon. Assuming that the d is super big. Okay. So here we want to. I mean, definitely worst case is not possible, right? So we have to seek for certain structures. So here at the structure I'm looking at is sparsity. Okay. So what is the sparsity here? So the sparsity is assumed in the optimal parameter, see the stock. Okay. So you can think, okay, so the other features, even though they have, you have a lot of features, D features like 1,000, uh, 10,000, right? Something like that. But only a few of them matters, and a lot of, uh, of them doesn't matter, right? So that's the sparsity. Yeah. So it's a sparsity requirement, okay? Right, so I mean, mathematically, you can think kind of this. Okay, so our optimal theta, the star, uh, has a zero norm one. So the zero norm of that thing, is upper binary, but S, S is the sparsity parameter. And of course, this, uh, this assumption is the usual, right? So this theta parameter is in, in the union ball, okay? That's, uh, that's what we have, okay? This is the sparsity structure. Basically, this part is to try to understand, well, if we have a sparsity, can we, it doesn't really help us you know, in resolving this misspecification, or get a better bunch than square root d times absolute in terms of error, or, Get better bonds than polynomial, in, sorry, exponential in D in terms of query complexity. Okay, okay good. Guys, <laughs> <laughs> yes, what's going on? Uh, maybe let me try another device. Okay, this one run out of power. Let me try something quickly. Okay, so let me use that. Uh, let's forget about it. <laughs> so it's, if you stop and share again, it works, but it doesn't work soon. Okay. Yeah, so let me just use this one.
Why does someone is having problems? Yeah. It's like research. Mm. <laughs> you always that find it's... bugs and then you have to resolve it again. Right. <laughs> Could it be that it is plugged in and that's the problem? I don't think so. It's like the screen is not broadcasting, right? Yeah, yeah, that's it. He's sharing my Gmail. No, 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 that's this one. It's not. Okay. okay. Maybe turn off your camera. Okay. Oh, it's all right. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Oh, yeah. Okay. What's enough? How is this sound? All right. Is it sound good? Uh, yeah. I mean, it's picking up on the sound. Yeah. Okay. So the problem is clear, right? Okay. Yeah. But there have been results for this uh, sparsely embedded setting without the specification. Without the specification. It's super easy. You just got uh, G optimal design. You log, log the many actions, play those actions, solve that. Done. Or you can, you can simply, I mean, there's no noise here, right? So you can simply pick D and in and in your yeah. kind of actions and solve that immediately. Yeah. How different is sparsity than like? Uh, theta star j is just arbitrarily close. It's like epsilon, arbitrarily close to zero, but not zero. Which one? So, like, imagine instead of sparsity, we replace it with like the theta star oh, j's have yeah. very low signal. Oh, uh, I see. Like, I see. It's almost like you don't have enough data to actually be able to. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, yeah. That's uh, this. This one can can handle that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. This is the this is the problem, right? The problem side. Yeah. Right. So it is a change, right? <laughs> I mean, so like I said, right? So if you query, if you want to resolve for theta, and we know that um, the theta is by this is square, right? The solution is uh, the sugar inverse of those five metrics times R. Okay. If you want to query every action, then of course you can solve it, but the number of that can be, the number of queries can be exponential, right? And if you only query D rows, like I said, right? D rows, um, or order D rows, according to uh, absolute and log factors. So then the error is below up by square root d factor all the time, right? Square root d times epsilon. Okay. All right. So if this by blowing up, I mean that there will be if you solve for theta using this many queries, there will be an action in the set, right? So such that the difference of this action's value to the optimal uh, or even to the approximation of the value itself is uh, square root d times epsilon. Okay. All right, so now uh, let's try to see how to use the sparsity to help uh, the learning. Okay, let's just try to get some intuitions, right? So here, this is sparsity. Okay. So let's just look at the, if we cover this space, right? cover this space using epsilon net that contains a uh, <coughs> stuff, right? So we immediately see that the number of such, uh, the, the, uh, the cover number, right? So of this, the size of this covering set is D choose S1, one to the S, right? So basically, for this set, you're gonna pick uh, a bunch of vectors so that the vectors has distance very small up to epsilon away, and and then and there will be one vector that is close to theta star. That's the cover, right? So if you look at how many vectors here, it's like this number. Okay. So if you look at closely at this number, so if s is small, right? If s is small, so this is d to the s, one well, over epsilon to the s, right? Immediately you see that this cover number is polynomial in d if s is fixed right so if we can somehow um use this intuition let's see if we can somehow like let's do that naively right so check every possible theta to see whether it's a good a good uh, whether it's good parameter or not 
I mean, without query too much, without querying and the actions too much, then you can immediately reduce the uh, number of queries to this number, which is polynomial in D, and it will fix the S, right? Okay. So that, that would be the first step we're going to do, okay? So try to, re, uh, try to recover an algorithm, <laughs> try to present an algorithm whose query complexity is just self avoided this. So you can think about whether you can do that immediately. <laughs> okay. So this uh, any any questions here? Okay. So this is a covering number, right? So we're gonna we're gonna have a uh, have a covering set n that covers this optimal parameter using this many actions. Okay. So now the idea is that we're gonna query a number of bumps until we find something incorrect. Okay. So basically, like if you give me a set in this n. I want to check whether it's correct or not. I need to query a bunch of arms, right? Until I find something that it's not correct. But this will be a disaster because right, you have to check too many arms, right, in order to find an incorrect arm. Okay. So so the query complexity will be will not be good. Okay. So that is uh, that's an immediate thought. Okay. So now the next thought is that can we query just one sample and get rid of a lot of the arms? That is the idea. It's a, it also this illumination type of things, right? In in uh, in modern in, in, in bonded research. Okay. So basically, you want to design something that you really don't need to query a lot of things, but you just query one thing that get rid of a lot of these arms, right? So if you can if you can group the things um, in a small number of groups, each group can be eliminated by one action uh, query, and so then the overall complexity can be reduced. Okay. So this is the elimination argument. So basically, for each estimated, uh, so <laughs> for each index set, so the index set in the sense that because it's sparse, we can just uh, guess right every possible S set. Right? So suppose that is our index set. So for every index set, we can guess a parameter. Right. So overall, that's one of our epsilon to the S many parameters. We can guess of this. Right? So then we. What we do, we should we, we shouldn't carry like all the actions to check whether that parameter is correct or not. So what we can actually do is that we're gonna <coughs> collect these actions. <coughs> we're gonna group these actions and the, if they have similar features. Okay. But similar in the sense of this index set. Okay. In this index set, they are similar. In particular, mathematically, we define this set. Okay. This set is a set of actions. It's a set of actions. So that under this Set up parameter, uh, so the value difference are close in a sense. Okay. So this this x is the action right? action in the product with theta hat is the you predicted the value, and uh, uh, w is another parameter. So that uh, is uh, is actually you're gonna use w to match the, you, you, to match the uh, the fit to the actions in this index set. Okay. So the rough idea is that. You're giving me a theta hat. I'm going to find out all these actions that have similar predicted value under this theta hat. Okay. So if you explain W again. W is another parameter. W is another parameter. It's like you're gonna have two apps on that. Okay. So you, you give an index set, right? So you can have the action actions um are projected onto this index set. It's only S dimensional. You can have an epsilon net to, to match those as well. So W is an uh, epsilon net to match the actions. Right. Yeah. And the theta hat is the, uh, is the other parameter. Okay. Basically, uh, so given W, you want to find all these actions that are close to W. And then you also want that to be close, like the value to be close to the epsilon over 2. Okay. So basically, it's an idea to group all these actions. So this number of groups you can immediately see, right? So this depends on the parameter m hat w theta hat, right? So it depends on those parameters. Now all of them, uh, if s is fixed, all of them, uh, the number of them is polynomial in d, right? If s is fixed, okay. So if we can query only one action to uh, to check whether this group entirely right, is correct or not, so then we're in a good shape. So that is the elimination type of algorithm. So basically, for every W and every M and M prime, there's an index set, right? Index set. So if we if we find okay, these two index set 
has a piece frequency. You know what it says? It says that, okay, so uh, if you measure the value, if you do the predict the value in one index set using uh, one group, the value is different from the other index set or the other group. I'm okay. here using this W group in it. Okay, so basically, uh, so for two groups, right, they predict different values. So you find, okay, even for the same action, you have a different value. So here I'm not doing the query, right? So I can look at all these actions, two groups, right? Look at whether there is an action so that the predicted value are different. So you different in terms of uh, the action. That means you find a discrepancy, right? you find a discrepancy of two sets, two index sets, right? So now what do you do? You just query that action. You just query that one action, okay? Not other actions, just query one action. So once you query the action, then you know either one of this one is incorrect, right? So you get rid of both of them, right? But at least one of them is incorrect because right? they have a discrepancy. So it doesn't mean. It means that uh, if you uh, query one action, then one index that can be ruled out. Right? One index that can be ruled out for every W. That's the idea. Right? So query any query can rule out one such a group. Okay? So based on this kind of animation idea, the total number of queries should be of order this guy. Right? So the number of uh, the, the number of uh, elements in the cover. So that is the idea. Any question? <laughs> yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so uh, I use something like EXP4. EXP4? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Subs uh, 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 split two times algorithm, but then it's two times. Uh, but then I would guess that some of the companies can be. Exponential, I guess. Expansion D, right? No? Not of this thing. EXP4 works by, you You need to carry every action, right? No? Finger perfection plus an expert. Experts, experts, but they carry. Yeah. Uh, I was just wondering whether, like, you have this action A, yeah, uh, which you use for detecting discrepancy. Yeah. If, so, uh, if you find a discrepancy, then you use A to rule out one of them. It's sure. not using A to detect. I don't know your whether A really needs to be in this special set R W M, or it could be just any action. Any like, action. Why does it this to that? I mean, if you really care just about, you know, like finding a discrepancy between these two sets. Yeah. You can use any action. Uh, arbitrary action? Yeah. Why, why in this set? Um, why are you doing this set? The arbitrary action, like, like the, other, the other groups, right? So this action may not, okay. So if you, uh, if you do this kind of a partition, if so you keep on arbitrary action, the values might be the same on that uh, on the action. The two the two sets can have the same value. But not every action they have a discrepancy. So there will be some actions that have discrepancy. I mean, we pick the action in this particular set here to find a discrepancy. So in a way, you are trying to find a weakness, but I don't see why the weakness really needs to belong. Maybe it's like ultimately we belong to this set, but I don't see why. Um, Why the best witness uh, for a discrepancy is in this set. Okay, maybe you, you got a good point. I mean, you can define other kind of queries as long as one query can rule out one of them. Yeah, that's our yeah, potential that's function. Right? Yeah. So any any such kind of design should work. Okay, yeah. so you just want to get the potential function to decrease. Yeah. Great. <laughs> other questions? All right. <laughs> All right. So this sounds like I mean not exciting. I mean. <laughs> But because uh, we need the fixed S, right? So to get the polynomial, a polynomial sample complexity. But if S is still big, right? For instance, the global constant, whatever, or, or square root D, right? So it's still exponential in D complexity, okay? So then we, we will ask, right? So can we do better? Can we do better? So can we have a polynomial S dependence? 
So let's get an S to the third Hamza epsilon. Maybe not uh, constant Hamza epsilon or square root S times epsilon, et cetera, right? Like that. Can we do better? Okay. Unfortunately, it's not. Okay. <laughs> the answer to the question is you cannot do better. Because uh, for any data that's smaller than one, so, so you can get a square root S, S whatever. The lower one is exponential in S. So yeah, any any data, any data that's smaller than one. Yeah. So uh, any questions for this? No. Okay. So for delta being one half, and for s that is close to b, you should get square root. Yeah. For for s. So, so let's say s is just d. S is just d. And uh, then we have the upper bound for delta being one half. Yeah, uh, I, I will bind it to, to be a th big data, right? Square root D. Uh, I mean, small data. Right. Okay. So, yeah. I guess one of the question is whether that S should be square root S. Oh, yeah, yeah. So we have some uh, restrictions for S. Um, I don't put it here. It's smaller than square root D. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good point. Yeah, the the low bound, the the proof of the low bound. I'm, I will just briefly mention that it's not too difficult. It's basically by reduction. It's um, close to the original paper, but it's so called an uh, index query problem. So basically, if I give you an, a vector of n dimensional, I want you to find maximum, maximum value in that in that vector. Right. So how many queries you need? So uh, this number of queries is omega of the dimension. Okay. So basically, the best you can do is check nearly all of the uh, coordinates, because otherwise you cannot find the find the find the maximum value. Okay. So here I'm going to do the we, we just basically embed the index query problem into a set of features, so that these features gives you a sparse linear problem, a sparse linear approximation. So the uh, the construction is just uh, establish a, a set of Gaussian features. A set of Gaussian features. This Gaussian feature is that sparse. You choose a, a, a random set as, as sparse and choose the Gaussian values on those coordinates. And it turns out that this index query for arbitrary vector can be embedded to the uh, can be embedded into the Gaussian features. Yeah. And then in that way, so the number of queries, you, you just need to count, right? So how many such vectors you can construct? It's exponential, yes. Yeah. That's the rough idea. It's good, but that doesn't. That seems like uh, uh, not exciting, right? So basically, can we improve this uh, exponential in S dependence? So, like we said, if you want to S to the delta and uh, for delta smaller than one, it's not possible, right? Maybe we should relax that additionally. For instance, you can do epsilon uh, times S, right? Uh, so you can look at square root times epsilon first. I mean, we know that this uh, can be still exponential. Or maybe you can get rid of this epsilon dependence. Right? So right now it's epsilon to the s dependence. Okay? It turns out you can, you can because we can get the square root epsilon s okay, by using uh, uh, like if you if I tell you right. So if I tell you that you have a fixed uh, index set, if I tell you the index set, so you can query, you can you can get optimal using only s log s many queries, right? Very easy. Okay, even even better than that one, right? So get a square root s and times epsilon. So maybe you can get this epsilon to the s dependence in, um, after some uh, handling, right? So after some guessing, after some guessing of the correct index set, right? The correct index set, the number of them has nothing to do uh, with epsilon, right? So that is the rough idea. Okay. So again, elimination. Okay. So, but we're gonna partition this like this way. So, like what you said, right? <laughs> this is uh, maybe if they exist, uh, there is a discrepancy. But so you have two action set, uh, two, two, two sets, right? And, 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 and so those are S sets. Right? For each one of them, you can use G optimal design to query, to get a, an estimator of theta hat. You know that this estimate is um, square root S times optimal. optimal. Okay. And then if you find an action, so that the estimate, the prediction of these two sets are different, right? How different they? 
and it's a square root s and that epsilon, right? So then you see that, okay, there's a huge discrepancy. You just query this action. You can eliminate one of them, right? You can eliminate one of them. So query each action for one of these index that is eliminated. But the total number of index that is, <coughs> is only D choose S, right? It has nothing to do with epsilon. This is some improvement about the epsilon dependence. Okay, it's still elimination type argument. Okay. Oh, that's clear. Okay. So now, we, uh, uh, I mean, this is the formal and more formal statement of theorem. Okay. Okay. So now we want to really want to get a polynomial in S query uh, algorithm. And right? so I don't want exponential in S at all. P choose S is still exponential in S. Right? Can we do? Uh, what, what can we do? Right. So. Obvious thing is that we want the data to be greater than one okay. as to the data times epsilon. Okay. As smaller, a data smaller than one is not possible. Okay. All right, so what, what should be the idea? So actually, this is the theorem. Let me tell you here. So I'm saying, that, okay, if your feature space is in line, in a sense that the number of features is small, or in other words, right? So I wanted the number of features to small. It's equivalent to see that you can use a small number of vectors to cover your feature space. Like that. Okay. So if number of them, log the number of them is smaller than some polynomial in S, okay. so then you can actually uh, uh, carry small number of samples, okay. small number of actions to get a good uh, solution as, it, uh, as to the data times epsilon. Okay. If the number of them is small, then you can carry, uh, you can you can get a good answer. So can can we guess the solution? Now what should be the solution that achieves this? If the total number of them is small, right? So then you can get a good solution pretty easily. <laughs> Any guess? It must keep coming from a union bond or something like that, right? <laughs> okay. yeah, yeah, basically we just do compression. Okay. So we compress the features, even though it's d-dimensional, we compress them into a smaller dimensional, let's say s-dimensional, whatever. Then do g-optimal design, and that's it. Uh, so the number of them is small. Yeah, that's the only meaning of this B9. So oh, the number of them, so here I'm assuming finite, right? So if you have infinite amount of features, that means you have a small covering number. So that means it's B9. Yeah. J is the number of actions. A number of actions is, is, I mean, it's the equivalent to number of feature vectors, right? Yeah. Uh, no, not the feature dimension. Okay, sorry, sorry about that. Okay. You just compress the thing, right? So using JL, uh, JL says that uh, if you compress a vector from D dimensional to be log k, k is the total number of them divided by epsilon square, then the inner product is preserved. Right? So because the inner product is preserved, so then you can you can look at this new binary problem. The new binary problem has slightly bigger. Uh, of uh, specification error, but you can still apply the dense, uh, dense uh, feature theory to solve it, right? Okay. Very simple, but still there's a big restriction. The restriction is that log k has to be small, right? Log k has to be small. Okay, what's next? So the next thing is that we really want to consider general features, right? The number of them can be exponential in D, okay? If the number of them is exponential in D, can we still have this point of sample complexity? Uh, when all the so that is the, that is the challenge. Okay. So we know that if you have a small number of them, right, they get a good answer uh, very quickly. Okay. So what should be um, what should be the next direction? Right? So the next direction is that we, we should look at these actions or feature actors, right? Like does every one of them matter? Right. So we will have an explanation D of them. But really, do they matter that much? Right? Maybe some of them we can immediately get rid of. We don't need to consider them at all. Right? So if we look at the G-optimal design right, for each index set, for each index set, how many of them really matters in terms of getting the optimal solution? So we know that it's at most S log S of them matters. Right? Not every of them <laughs> matters in terms of getting good error. So you just carry this many actions, as long as many actions, you can already get a good estimate of what they have in terms of that index set. Right? So basically, this gives us idea, right? So for every index set, only this many polynomial or as many actions matter. But 
the at most d choose s such index set. Right? For each such index set, this many actions matter. The total number of actions that matter is this one. D choose s and so yes. The rest of things that get rid of them, I don't need to care, care about that anymore. And now you just apply this D9 feature of theorem, you're done, right? So that is the overall solution. Okay. So just compress only these actions, right? So, but because this number of them is small, you take a log of that is still polynomial S and log D, right? So, but you can get a good solution already. So uh, this algorithm, but the, uh, the forgotten algorithm, right? So the theorem says that you just need S queries, okay, small number of queries. Okay, you can get a, a maybe there's an OT of S queries to get an S times the epsilon um, uh, optimal action. Okay, so still we want to some restrictions. Okay, so want an S could be a bigger than log D of epsilon square, something like that. Okay, so that is basically all the results. And before I to the summary, any questions here? Okay. I didn't get your restriction on S at the end, like why a lower bound of S. Oh, yeah. So it's it's basically, oh, yeah, it's not immediate because uh, it's coming from the compression arrow. So the compression, uh, yeah, it's coming from the compression arrow. So you wanted this one to be awarded at the square root S and that one. You do the, uh, do the computation eventually. You really need uh, the compression arrow of the same order of your uh, of your I mean, specification error, right? If you have that, you have to put a lower bound on S. Yeah, that might be the slight restriction for, for this result. Do you think it's pretty necessary if you have that? Oh, actually, I don't, right? So if S is small, right? So then you just do this app, the brute force search. Yeah, the brute force search is still um, quite deep. Right? It doesn't matter. Oh. Yeah. Other questions? All right. So in the summary, we can break this exponential in D assemble burial by using sparsity, right? Uh, um, in the sense that if, if I mean, first of all, we say a proof where alpha bound and low bound says that if you want to ask uh, to better that epsilon uh, approximation, then it's not possible to get rid of square uh, exponential in S dependence, right? But if you want to that to be greater than one, then polynomial number of action, uh, polynomial number of actions pulling can give you a good estimate into the solution, right? Okay. Uh, so there's some open question. The four I think it's done immediately, right? So then maybe other structure information that uh, that is more interesting you can also look at, right? So uh, this facility we can find a, a very good structure information that only that small number of actions matter, right? So other things doesn't matter. So for other structures, maybe you have better things. Okay. And uh, what else? Okay. Yeah, so that's that's everything for this result. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I didn't quite get that last bit, like why do, uh, when you have uh, a small index set, yeah. why do, why, uh, why is there D log D or S log S? Oh, well, log S, that's log S uh, of them matters, right? That's not coming from uh, from optimal design, right? Like, yeah, optimal design. So if you do the optimal design, the number of actions you need to pull is as double of S, actually. Oh, okay. Yeah, so then you can get a square root S times S in estimated, right? Already. That means that you don't really need to look at all that. Only a few of them. Is so we're doing a de optimal design on the coordinates uh, which are in the index set. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for every index set, you look at it, you're going to And I keep those actions, the rest get rid of them. That's a very good point. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good point. Very good point. Yeah, so this one also relates to the open poem I was saying yesterday, right? So maybe you don't need to put the uniform up above, uh, so on the on the uh, epsilon. You can put uh, uh, the bound as follows, right? So the uh, 
uh, the 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 error of misclassification error of each one is proportional to some function of the gap. So the gap, in the sense, the value of that action to the optimal action, right? So then you can still have some algorithm to solve it. But now you don't have a uniform map of bond. Right? That maybe give you uh, better results. Does that make sense? <laughs> Other questions? Yeah, if not, uh, thank you all. <laughs>